All right, fantastic. Welcome, welcome. I'm going to share my screen. If at any point, oh, hi, Maureen. That's your course. How fun. If at any point during the presentation, I'm clearly talking about something that is not on the screen, somebody please unmute and yell at me. Right now, you should be looking at a PowerPoint slideshow, online class communication plans that work. I want to begin by saying this is my last workshop of the semester. So thank you for being here. I really do appreciate your time and dedication to online education. And if anybody doesn't know me, my name is Michael. I teach anthropology, and I'm also the online education faculty coordinator, which is just the long, fancy title. That means I get to support faculty who teach online, just like all of you. So it's my pleasure to be here with you and to share a little bit about what has been working for me and other instructors when it comes to communication plans that work for online students. So without much delay, we're going to set up some goals and objectives for our time together. Here we go. Something I always like to try and do, even in my classes, I, I like to do this um, at the beginning of the day or at the top of the module. What are we going to focus on for our next 45 to 60 minutes together? First of all, we're going to identify regular and effective contact. Throughout your online teaching trainings, you've likely heard that term before. So we just want to do a rather brief recap on what that's all about, and then get into the more how do we actually make that happen. Then we're going to move on to identify some best practices for online course communication plans. We will identify some tools and technology to help us do our jobs better, and then employ some equity-minded communication with our students. And throughout all three of those things, I'm going to do some demonstrations and show you what this can actually look like in your online classes too. And then we're going to end with some Q&A. And hopefully last 10, 15 minutes or so, uh, we can just have a discussion, share what's working for you, uh, what you want to improve upon. Uh, I love those sorts of conversations. In fact, let's begin with a brief conversation. In the Zoom chat box, I just want to take a minute or so, but I'd like you to type in the most frequent method of communication that your online students use to contact you. For example, you might put Canvas inbox, or you might have um, a discussion form in the course that your students tend to use more. Go ahead and share that in the chat for me, please. Okay, Courtney, Robert, Kanisha, Robert, yep, Canvas inbox, inbox, email, okay, Pamela says email, good, Canvas inbox from Maureen, inbox and email, journal entries from Maureen, great, wonderful, awesome, oh, a Google number, oh, we'll talk about that in a bit, Valerie, thank you, yeah, okay, great, thank you so much, I always like to ask that question when I talk with faculty about communication with students, because it's very important for us to understand what modes of communication students are more likely to use. We'll get into some of the details on what that looks like through the presentation. But I want to begin with a brief anecdote on effective communication. The year was 2016. I was a brand new full-time faculty in the Department of Social Sciences teaching anthropology. I was very new. I was very green. I wore a tie to work every day because it made me feel like I belonged here. And I was incredibly nervous. In that class, Anthropology 2, Cultural Anthropology, I had a student who was struggling significantly in the class, uh, missing classes. And this was this was on campus, by the way, missing classes, missing assignments, uh, not doing well on exams. 
and a lot of life issues were getting in the way of this student's success. Many things out of this student's control. One day, I was crossing Carson Street, going from you know where the T building is to the A building, walking right across Carson there, waiting at the light that sometimes seems to take forever. And I ran into that student from my class. And I said, hey, it's good to see you. How's your day? And we just had a conversation waiting for the light to change so that we could cross the street. And then we ended up walking together, talking for a few minutes and saying goodbye. The next class, the students stayed after and continued that conversation with me. And we were able to engage a little bit more. And I learned about a lot of these things that they were struggling with in their personal life. And then they came to office hours and we continued the conversation even more. All of us have had comparable interactions with this one. When we pull the student aside after class, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? Or when we pass one of our students in the hallway, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Or I know I've seen it. I've, I've run into my students at their jobs in the past, and they always seem very shocked, like that I'm a normal human being that needs to go shopping and things. But we've all had interactions like this. And, and for me, it's one of my favorite parts of this job when we get to learn more about our students. And by the way, as a side note, this particular student is now finishing up their uh, bachelor's degree in anthropology at university. So we helped get them on track and support them with what they needed. But here's the thing about online education. How can we facilitate comparable interactions with our online students? We probably will not see our online students while we are crossing the street, or we probably won't bump into them at their place of work. Online, asynchronous, we probably won't even have a conversation with them before or after a class time because there is no class time for asynchronous online. If we're lucky, they will visit our office hours, but that's not always guaranteed with their schedules. So how can we ensure effective communication? It is possible, but it takes a different approach. It must be intentional. It takes work and at times some creativity for how we can have these sort of crosswalk conversations with our online students too. So the first thing we need to think about is regular and effective contact. Oops. And this is a Title V regulation. This is bottom line, what we have to do as online instructors. I mean, we could read the whole thing, but the gist of it is this. Regular and effective contact involves the frequent communication between instructor and students and amongst student peers. This can take place in Zoom or in Canvas or a combination of both, depending on your teaching modality. But this is a requirement uh, that, you know, online teachers, Title V, regular and effective contact, this is not an optional embellishment or extra thing to do. This is the minimum standard of what we can do. So just always like to give that the context it deserves. But what does this actually look like in practice? That might vary depending on your style, depending on your modality, and that's okay. The California Virtual Campus Online Education Initiative provides some recommendations for us. For example, the courses offer regular instructor-initiated contact with students. That includes an expectation for when students will be contacted by their professor. Students, it also goes the other way, students are encouraged to contact us 
through easily accessed contact info that includes response times or when we expect to get back to them. Also offering unstructured student interaction amongst their peers. This is often something like a, a class lounge discussion board within Canvas where students can go into this discussion board and start a conversation amongst themselves. Not unlike in a physical classroom when students first sit down and they chit chat a little bit before we start our lessons. And then of course, more structured contact among students with topics in our curriculum. So for me, every week, I have a discussion forum in Canvas, and it is asking students to talk with each other about a specific piece of content in my class. These are the same things, the same discussion questions I would put forward in a face-to-face -face class too. So let's think about realistic communication plans. We want to do this in a way that is effective for students and also realistic for us as the instructors. Here are some elements of effective communication plans. When we put these forward, including an expected response time, it reduces frustration and anxiety from our students. They know how to get a hold of us. It's reasonable, and they know when they expect when they can expect a reply. Some parts of that include your preferred method of contact, like what you put in the chat, email, Canvas inbox, student question form in Canvas, your expected response time. We'll say one to two days, Monday through Friday. What students should do if they do not receive a response from you. We've all missed an email at some point in our lives. For the student who only emails us once or twice a semester when they're having a big problem, if that's the one that we accidentally miss, that's a really big deal for them. So putting something in place on what they should do if we don't respond within one to two days, it's a good move. And then also putting this communication plan in more than one place. Don't hide it on the last page of your syllabus. Uh, it, it should go on your home page or in an about me page or even as your email signature. I've seen that before as well. So let me show you three examples. And this first one is just in the slide. It's one of mine, one of my communication plans. And this is just copy pasted from my syllabus. Um, you know, I always like to put a little something. I, I like working with you. Let's talk. I'm gonna answer your emails as best I can within 24 hours, Monday through Friday. And if you don't hear back from me, please email or text me again. And yes, I do encourage my students to text message me on their phones. I'll talk about that in a couple more slides. I also let them know I'm gonna send out weekly announcements to keep you up to date. So keep an eye out for those. I also talk about grading. Now for me, 72 hours is reasonable. I only have one class right now. When I have a larger teaching load, that might turn more into five days, maybe a week, depending on the assignment. That's okay. Putting something that is reasonable forward so they have an expectation, that's a good idea. Here's one. If I do not hear from you or you stop participating, I'm going to reach out to you. I'm going to email you. I'm going to call. I'm going to text. Make sure you're okay. And I have done that in the past. Texting. And after students may miss email after email after email, they get a text from me and they respond within five minutes. So having more than one way to contact them, it's helpful. Then, of course, respect, trust, collegiality. I put that in a lot of places in my course. But let me show you two more examples of communication plans. 
in actual Canvas courses. The first one is from one of our very own, Maureen Baker, who's here today. Hi, Maureen. And this is Maureen's Accounting 120 class. Let me make that a little larger. There we go. So this is Maureen's homepage. And one thing I really like about it is these five buttons up here. These appear in a lot of different pages throughout the course. But the first one, need help. I'm here for you. And look, students can click on that right away and see Maureen's communication plan. And this, I really like the way this is structured because it gives very clear instructions on, hey, here's what you're asking about. Here's the best way to get a hold of me for that thing. And here's my response time when you get a hold of me this way for that thing. Even clarifying, how will I keep in touch with you? Here's what you can expect. How often you might expect that Canvas announcement. And so on and so forth. So it's very, very clear, not just how students can reach the instructor, but what the students can expect from the instructor. A second example, here we go, is from Professor of Sociology, Lizette Rodriguez. And right away from Lizette's homepage, there's a quick, you know, here's my, here's my quick email. Here's what you can expect from me. Here are my student hours. And that's great. That's a wonderful start. In addition to that, in Lizette's first module, in the About Your Instructor page, she has a, a video introducing herself, and then also clarifying how you can contact me and how I will contact you. Again, having both of those elements is really, really helpful for keeping our students aware of what to expect in the class. And then lastly, I showed you mine on the slide too, but just for another perspective in my course, this is my homepage at the very bottom. I list brief contact information, email, Google Voice, YouTube channel. Some people message me in YouTube and that's okay because I have a lot of YouTube videos in my course. But then I also have a button, contact professor, where students can click on that and learn a little bit about me and also see my communication plan there as well. So different ways of presenting that same information, but as long as it is clear and consistent across these different pages, right? So if I have something on my home page that contradicts what I have typed here, that might create confusion. Same thing, if something on my syllabus is different from what is on my Canvas page, that might create confusion. So ensure that your communication plans are clear and consistent across the different ways that you present them. Here we go. Oops. Okay, let's be honest. Let's be reasonable. I'm all about that. Do not make promises you cannot keep. Just the other week, I had a conversation with a relatively new instructor to the campus, and they had put their communication plan, uh, I'll, I'll get back to you in 12 hours or less. And I was like, well, that's that's great. That's, that's awesome. That, that's your aim. But is that realistic? And, and so we, we agreed that 24 to 48 hours is more reasonable. As if, if we put something forward of that quick a turnaround, um, it will be disappointing when we do not meet that expectation. Work-life balance is a good thing. I am not advocating for faculty to be on their emails or in Canvas 24 hours a day. But we want to understand it's really stressful for students to not get a response within a day or two. Sometimes I get emails from students and I don't have the time to give them the detailed answer that they need at that moment. 
but I will always put just one line. Thanks. I'll get back to you tomorrow. That's better than nothing at all. But then, of course, I, I make a note. I need to follow up with that student uh, when I say that I'm going to follow up. So being honest, being a little transparent. Hey, I, I need a day, but thanks for the email. I'll get back to you. That just works wonders at reducing the student's anxiety when they contact their professors. All right, so let's talk about some tools and technology to support our work. And let me put it this way. I'm a big believer that the technology should serve us, not the other way around. So I'm not here to try and sell you on any tool or technology that doesn't meet your needs. Try it out. If you like it, use it. If not, Canvas has pretty much everything that you're going to need anyway. That's okay. But let's start off with Canvas. Let's take a look at our notification settings. There's a lot of ways for students to contact us in Canvas. Announcements, great book comments, Canvas inbox, discussion forums, what have you. Unless we, the instructors, turn those notifications on, we are more likely to miss the content of those messages, thus further frustrating our students for not receiving a reply within the time frame we give in our communication plans. So there's a lot you can do, and I'm going to show you in Canvas in a moment, but for me, these are the three that I strongly urge you to make notify immediately. An announcement, a submission comment, and a conversation message. Let me show you that right now. So I'm in Canvas, and I'm going to go to my account here at the top left. And the first option, notifications. Now I can do this. See right here, I'll make it a little larger. I can do this for my entire account or I can just do one class at a time. But for today, we're just gonna do my entire account, which will trickle down into every single class that I am the teacher in. There's a lot of options here, but the first one I recommend is announcements. And announce, excuse me, announcements created by you. That's the key. If you hover over it, see how it says replies to announcements you've created? That's what I want to know about. In my class, I do at least one announcement every week. And when a student replies to that announcement, I want it sent to my email so I can respond to it if they have a question there. So that one, I, you can click on the icon here and set notify immediately, or at the end of the day, you get a summary, or at the end of the week, or turn them off. I wouldn't turn them off. I recommend notify immediately. Moving down, there's a couple here that I do not recommend turning on. For example, all submissions. If you turn that on, now every time every student submits something in your classes, you will get an email about it. To me, that is way too much information. I'm turning that off. Probably got 10 emails already. However, submission comments, I do turn on notify immediately. When a student submits an assignment, there's a little box where they can leave a submission comment. Sometimes they ask a question or sometimes they let me know what's been going on and why their assignment is late. I want that comment pushed to my email immediately. So I turn that one on. And the last one I, I urge you uh, strongly to turn on is conversation message. And I, I still don't know why they call it this because that's 
what they're calling the canvas inbox. Okay? If conversation message is turned off, then when a student messages us through the inbox, it will not get pushed to our email. So it's really important. You all put in the chat earlier, a ton of your students use the Canvas inbox first. Mine do too. Turning this on immediately will make that go straight to your email so we can respond to them in a more timely manner. Another thing from my slide is if you have a, a student lounge or a student Q&A forum in the class, you might want to subscribe to that forum so you know when students are posting there. For example, let's say, oops, I need to go back to my class. I'll just go to the first discussion forum. Okay, so in a discussion forum, okay, we create the prompt, we do all that good stuff. There's this button at the bottom right of it. By default, it is not subscribed, but by clicking on that, you are now subscribed to the forum. And it even says in that little, little text box there, uh, you will be notified of new comments. Now, you might not want to do that on every discussion forum in your course, but if there's one dedicated to student questions or uh, I have one on my student project, if they have questions about that specific thing, then that might be very helpful for you to be alerted to those uh, comments immediately by subscribing there. Okay. Oh, and lastly, the Canvas app. All right. So the Canvas app. I have I have mixed feelings about the Canvas app, but one thing I do really like about it is the, the notifications that get put onto my phone. And for that, I'm going to try and do this right the first time. Here we go. You should be looking at my phone right now. And this is a little strange because I can no longer see any of you. So <laughs> unmute if, if some pardon. I can't see the phone. You can't see the see phone. A, I just see a number one in the top left corner, but not the phone. Oh no. Yeah, it's on your slide deck. It's on my slide deck. Ah, yeah, okay. PowerPoint, yeah. So I'm going to sometimes starting a new share is the best way to go. Let's try. How's that look? Can you see a phone yet? No. Anybody? No. Well, that's a shame. Okay. Then I won't show you that, but I'll tell you about it. You know, you rehearse these things just like you do for a class and then they don't work. You just got to roll with it. That's okay. So the app, the only way that I use it is for communication. When a student messages me, I turn on the Canvas app so that it gives me a little ding on my phone when those things come through. And that's helpful to me because I just I like to have multiple ways of responding to the students, even if it's something very, very brief. Let's go here. Okay, back to the slideshow then. Boop, boop, boop. Okay, from current slide. Good, good, good. All right. Another thing about communication. Be a little intrusive. And, and I know intrusive can have a connotation of, you know, rudeness or meanness. But in this context, I'm talking about being intrusive. Much like running into a student on campus and stopping them for a moment to say hello. That can involve regular Canvas announcements. I always like to enable replies to announcements and include alternative contact methods. One thing I've recently started doing, and it's worked out rather well, 
is when I post an announcement. This is very short, right? It's nothing terribly long. I'm just saying, hey, let's talk about your project in office hours. And oh, you can't make office hours? Then give me a text. And I then that's exactly what happened. I had several students come to office hour, but then several who could not, and they just text messaged me a little bit later. Great. I it worked because they got to ask their question. Use the message students who in the Canvas grade book. I love that feature for being a little bit intrusive, reaching out to folks who didn't perform as well as they could have or who didn't submit anything at all. I'll show you that in a second. Use the Canvas Speed Grader comment box. Again, that's very, very helpful. It goes to your students' Canvas inbox as well. Try new analytics. Try the new analytics feature in Canvas. That's pretty fun, and I'll show you that in a second. And then if you try all these things and still don't hear from your students, try their personal email or their phone. You can get that information in PeopleSoft with your roster. It, show, it shows those two things, their email and their phone number. And you can call or you can text uh, whatever way that you would prefer to reach out to them initially. But let me show you these middle three techniques rather briefly. And for this, I'm not going to show you student names. I'm going to show you some faculty names instead. All right, we'll do the 10 day challenge. Why not? This is a training course, new accessibility skill every day for 10 days, but it's really neat because when I click on the grade book, we're all familiar with this. We know what this looks like. I can say, I'll hover over this one and see the, it's so hard to see, but see those three vertical dots appearing? You click on those things and look, there's, there's a bunch of stuff you can click on and play around with. But today, we just want to click on message students who. And now I can select, where'd you go? folks who have not submitted or folks who may be marked incomplete. If it was out of 10 points, I could say, I want to message everybody who scored below a seven, suggesting they didn't pass. And this will send out an individual message to all of those people based on the criteria that I put. And again, you type a nice message here, asking, uh, What's going on? Are you are they planning to do the work? Something to that effect. You can even do an attachment if you need to. I think I don't remember that. That might be new. That's neat. The second one that's pretty helpful is the Canvas Speed Grader comment box. In fact, if I just click on any one of these, again, those three vertical dots, and click on Speed Grader. This is where I spend a lot of my time every week. Every week, I'm in the speed grader quite a bit. And this is the test students. There should be a submission on the left. You can make it smaller or larger. And if you have a rubric, there's a rubric on the right. But down here, the comment box, this is where I put so many comments for my students. And then once you do that, let's say we submit it, then the student can now respond and their response will be listed immediately below mine. And we can have a little conversation right within the speed grader. That is also why, going back to my notification settings earlier, I suggest you turn on assignment comments so that you are alerted when students comment with you in the speed grader. You could do attachments here. You can record a little video and have it here as well. Um, this to me, when it comes to assessments, when it comes to grading assignments, 
this is incredibly impactful so that our students you know know what they're doing besides just getting a, a grade or a complete or incomplete in this case and the last one here is the new analytics feature this one is pretty neat let me go back um no i'll go back here yeah so from the home page in any course in which you are a teacher there's a lot of these gray buttons to the right hand side new analytics it's not really new it's been around for a bit but it is interesting new analytics provides an enhanced way of reaching out and tracking our student activity now there's several things you can do here but in terms of a communication plan and something that makes our jobs a little bit easier, just click on the email button, message students who. And now, whereas in the grade book, I was looking at one item at a time, now I can message the entire class based on their overall grade in the class. So I could say, I wanna email all my students with a zero to 69, percent about hey let's have a conversation about how we can improve and and help you pass the course if that's what you want to do and and something i also like to do don't forget you know i like to email my students who are doing well who are passing maybe students who are doing exceptionally well and you know what i from the 90 to 100 I, I almost always message them and say, hey, have you ever thought about majoring in anthropology? And it, because they're doing, they're performing very well and I want them to feel, hey, this is a field for you too. So use this tool. Uh, you could do score range. You could do who's missing what, uh, what, what is late. Again, this looks different because it's a training, not an actual class, but you get the gist here. Uh, the score range is the one I use most frequently, so I'd recommend starting there if you'd like. This is really helpful, by the way, before the uh, withdrawal deadline, which is already passed. But next go around, I always use new analytics to reach out to students who aren't passing and let them know, hey, if you want to drop, if you want to withdraw, Sunday's the deadline. You know, let me know what you decide to do. And that could be really helpful for them to be aware. Okay, great. Let's move right along. Use your email wisely. So we talked about the Canvas notifications enabled properly. When that is done, all the important communication should feed into your LBCC email. I encourage you to triage your follow-up. And that means to glance over what emails you have received and prioritize who needs a response now, whose response can wait until this evening, whose response can wait until tomorrow, or who doesn't need a response at all. Great. Consider a mobile email app. And unfortunately, I was also going to show you that on my phone too. Since the screen share for that doesn't seem to be working, I'm not going to show you that. But I will show you the employment of flags and pins to prioritize and track your student responses. I know that sounds kind of silly, but it's it's a it's a technique that I'm finding we've never been told to do this. And it's something that really helps me stay organized with my prioritization. So look, I'm just going to bring up my email. Hopefully there's nothing too exciting in here. Um, okay, yeah. This is my Outlook email. I have it on my computer. And yes, there's all sorts of fun emails in here. But I set myself some emails as if I was a student for this demonstration. So here's one now. Okay, look, so, hey, professor, I got this, I'm dealing with something. 
this has been going on. Um, tell me what you think. So as I get emails, I tend to do two things with them. One, I either flag it so that it's easily identified that I still need to respond to that one. And if it's something I need to respond to more urgently, but I can't in the moment, I will also see the pin. It's like a push pin. I will click the pin and watch what happens to it. Don't worry, it didn't get deleted. When you pin an email, it goes to the top of your email inbox. I'll pin another one. Uh, let's see, uh, IITS, yeah. I'm gonna pin that one, whoop, and then it goes to the very top of my email. So that way I know, okay, I, I'm gonna start with these tomorrow. And then as I respond to them, I unpin and I unpin and they go back to the chronological display in the email too. That to me, that, that's a game changer. And this is something I do on my phone often. I'll get an email on my phone. And again, I wish I could show you on the app, but you can slide it one way for a flag and slide it the other way for a pin. And so sometimes I was actually glancing at my phone, uh, you know, not that I would ever do that in the middle of a Zoom meeting, but if I happen to do that in the middle of a Zoom meeting, then I would just pin it so that I know I want to respond to that uh, first thing when I'm done with this meeting. So a couple of little tricks that help me keep those things straight. Consider text messages. Now, before I get into the details, I know this can be uh, um, a hard sell at times for faculty, and that's okay. Like, I'm not saying you need to do these things, but since I started offering the option for my students to text message me, I feel that I've been able to reach and connect with folks that otherwise may have dropped or not passed the class. So I have seen a benefit to it. Remind.com is how I started. I, I started using Remind about five years ago. And it is an app that you can get on your phone. There's a free version and there is a paid version. But it's nice if you want to send an announcement to all students, maybe even in all of your classes at the same time. And the students can respond to that with their phone, they just text it back and it all functions through the Remind app. It's nice because all phone numbers are confidential. They don't have uh, your phone number. And once the semester is over, you just delete that Remind.com group and it is gone forever. These past few years, well, really since COVID, uh, I've adopted Google Voice instead. And that functions a little bit differently than Remind. But the good news is if you have a Gmail account, you already have a Google phone number or you can very quickly get a Google phone number. You can literally just do a Google search for Google Voice and it will walk you through how to set this up. This is something I also have on my phone. It is the Google Voice app which allows me to, it gives me a new phone number, not my personal phone number, and allows me to text message students uh, through that app and they can respond to me one-on-one. -on -one. It's not very good for group text messages. Uh, if that's your goal, I would suggest remind.com. But again, it's the sort of thing where, where when the option of texting is available, I'm finding a lot of students will take advantage in a good way. They, they will take us up on that option to text message us. And let us also touch on the equity mindedness of communication. You know, maybe, maybe it's my background as a linguistic anthropologist. You know, communication is culturally very symbolic. There are many different ways that people feel comfortable communicating, but we're finding that some 
specific steps can help make that communication a little bit easier, uh, particularly with our students who maybe haven't communicated very much with their teachers in the past. So I want to give you really just, just three, three words to think about when it comes to equity-minded communication. The first word is partner. Partner with the student. When you get a Canvas inbox message, how can we partner with a student in a sentence or less? Validate, the second word. Again, that Canvas inbox message or that submission comment. How can we validate that their question or concern or their experience is worth your time? And then finally, demystify. In a sentence or less, in an email, how can we clarify exactly what the student needs to know or give them guidance or additional resources that will be most helpful to them? These, by the way, are pulled from our online course, Cultural Curriculum Audit. And we have an exercise with faculty in the audit where we give them sample student emails and we have them reply to those sample student emails, making sure that they partner, validate, and demystify something in their response. So think about looking at my email again, think about that sample email. I'll make it larger here, right? We've, we've all received an email like this before from a student. Sorry, professor, I've been busy with a family loss, trying to get everything situated for my mother. She thinks not going to school means no homework. Yeah, I've heard that. I attended the Zoom. I just wondering if I still turn in my assignment from last week uh, and get partial credit, okay? So yeah, there are typos. I, I don't care about that. What I care about from the equity-minded perspective is how can I partner, validate, and demystify? Partner, I usually start my emails with students or colleagues. Hey, thanks for the email. I appreciate it. One sentence. Thanks for contacting me. Validate. Well, in this case, I'd validate by saying, I'm so sorry for your loss. And I understand what your mother <laughs> might be thinking or something to that effect. Right? Validating what they are saying. This is, yeah, this is worth my time. I understand what you mean. And then demystify. I'm going to remind them of my late work policy. Absolutely. Turn it in next week. Let me know what works for you. But then I always like to end it by saying, please email me when you submit it so that I know. And guess what? When I get emails like this, I flag them and pin them so I know I'm going to follow up if for some reason I don't get anything from this student. It's going to be there as my little reminder <clears throat> that, hey, they're still doing something uh, for makeup work. So just a, just a touch of equity-mindedness, but you'd be surprised how rarely uh, people get thanked for sending an email to their professors. So it's a small gesture. It can go a long way. Let's get to final thoughts and then questions. A few takeaways. Communicating effectively online is an ongoing learning process. Yes, I try new things a lot. Some of them do not work. Okay, I, I've tried different apps. I've tried uh, different styles of forums and they nobody used it. Not a one, not one student used it. Oh, well, I'm not doing that again. That's okay. That's okay. That's part of the process. Also, meeting all the students where they are, whether it's an email, inbox, forum, text message, 
that's arduous. That's a lot of work. Pace yourself, right? Don't want you burning out by trying 10 new phone numbers in one semester. Don't do that to yourself. Here's one that I feel is quite important. Learn about your students. When I ran into that student while waiting for the light to change on Carson Street, um, you know, I knew their face. Um, I knew their name. I knew just a little bit about them in the sense that they, at that time, weren't doing very well in my class. We should strive to learn about our online students that way as well. Now, we might not hear their voice. We might not see their face, but we can know their name. We can learn a little bit about them, let's say, in an introductory assignment about them. And try and remember that stuff. So when they email you, you can follow up. Hey, how's work going? Or, hey, I, I remember you're close to graduation. Have any questions? Th those, those little gestures of remembering something about our online students, it can break down possible communication barriers too. First, impressions matter. And that goes online as well. Uh, if if a student emails, you know, first couple of weeks of the semester with the question, you know, they they're they're a little stressed out about maybe they didn't get their textbook in time, and they're worried about their assignment. Uh, if if we don't respond to that, that's going to shape the way that they interact or don't interact with us for the rest of the term. Uh, those first impressions matter, and also you know the. The, the way in which we respond to student questions matters. If a student writes to us about a loss in their family, and one of the first things we say isn't my condolences, I feel that has an impact. And then finally, be kind to yourself. Unplug when necessary. I told you about these apps and things I have on my phone. Guess what happens to my phone every evening when I get home and I'm with my kids? Silenced, plugged up, put away. Because I don't want to be distracted. During winter and summer, when I'm not teaching, right? When I'm not teaching, I, I delete the email app off of my phone. Because why would I need it? I don't, I don't need that distraction right now. So it is okay to take a break from the technology. There's nothing wrong with that. We don't wanna burn ourselves out with checking our phone first thing in the morning when we wake up and making it the last thing we see before falling asleep. I don't think that's very sustainable. But with that, we've talked about a lot of things, communication plans and otherwise. I hope this was helpful. I hope this gave you some thing to think about as you plan your courses in the winter or in the upcoming spring. Uh, but right now I'm gonna stop the recording, went a little longer, I apologize, and take some questions. Thank you for being here. If you have to go now, that's okay too.